This episode of Because Science is sponsored by Fallout 76. Our future begins on November 14th, 2018. Did you know that Fallout's mini nukes really exist? Hello there, Wanderer. Looking to return post-nuclear America to its former glory? Well, you're headed towards some pretty bad territory, pal. Better take one of these. Do you know how to use one of these? But did you know that Fallout-style mini-nukes actually exist? Nuclear weapons have always been super critical to the Fallout series, but in these games there is perhaps no weapon more famous than the so-called mini-nuke. The size of a football and launched from a shoulder-mounted catapult, there are few armaments more devastating. It's the perfect weapon for a franchise built by the power of the atom, and though it is certainly sci-fi, the concept of a miniaturized nuclear bomb is more feasible than you think. Generally speaking, nuclear weapons attempt to aim both nuclear fusion and nuclear fission towards destructive ends. In nuclear fusion, we force atoms so close together that they eventually combine. And when that happens, they lose some of their mass, and that mass is converted directly into energy according to Einstein's E equals mc squared, and a neutron is emitted. In nuclear fission, we split atoms in half, and when that happens, energy is also released and neutrons come flying out of that split. Both nuclear fusion and nuclear fission require relatively extreme conditions to occur, like conditions you'd find inside of a star. And so, nuclear weapons are humanity's best attempt at tricking Mother Nature into letting us grasp cosmic power. What was that? Was that like your Neil deGrasse Tyson impression or something? No. I mean, maybe. Both nuclear fusion and nuclear fission are different physical processes, but in bomb form, we initiate those processes in the same way, by bringing atoms close enough together until something bad happens. In nuclear fission bombs, we use high explosives to bring something like uranium-235 so close together that the element goes critical, meaning that if one randomly emitted a neutron or underwent nuclear fission, which releases on average 2.5 neutrons, then one of those neutrons would be close enough to another uranium atom to sustain the reaction. As you can see, these chain reactions can get out of control very, very quickly, which is why nuclear physics is kind of dangerous in the first place. After just 20 rounds of this process, up to 90 million uranium atoms in this example could have undergone fission, releasing energy at every single step, millions of times more energy per unit mass than coal releases when you burn it. And in nuclear fusion bombs, we put nuclear fission bombs inside of them to kickstart the fusion reaction, which were releases even more energy per unit mass than a fission reaction does. Oh no! Oh. The first nuclear weapons trying to get all of this physics right were enormous. The first fusion bomb was the size of a bus, literally. The weapons did get smaller over the years thanks to improved methods and technology, but to get to mini-nuke level, a different approach is needed. One idea that scientists came up with is gas boosting. Here's a diagram of a gas-boosted fission bomb. Around the outside of it, you have high explosive. Underneath that, you have some fission material, and at the very core, you have some gas that you want to undergo nuclear fusion. When the high explosive goes off, it compresses both the fission and the fusion material at the very core. This fusion reaction at the core releases extra neutrons into the fissionable material, which creates an even more vigorous fission reaction than you would have started with, which means you do not need as much fissionable material, which means you do not need as much high explosive, which means the bomb doesn't need to be as big. Gas boosting allowed nuclear weapons engineers to miniaturize their terrible creations, and they came surprisingly close to mini-nuke size. Heads up! <laughs> when you emerge, harnessing the power of the atom will be just as important to your survival as it was before the bombs fell. Do you know where to start? I do, with the smallest and most convenient nuclear weapon system ever developed. You might want to get a haircut, though. What? No, I, I mean, it's fine, I think. Are you sure? Yeah, it's not, I mean, it's not that bad. Okay, it's your funeral, pal. What? 
As nuclear scientists got better and better at miniaturizing, the closest thing that they came up with to the mini nuke would have to be the Davy Crockett weapon system. This was a nuclear warhead mounted on the top of a recoilless gun that could be fired from a Jeep, an armored personnel carrier, or mounted onto a tripod and fired in the field by a three person team. It was a fission warhead and relatively speaking, it was shockingly small, literally this big. Still pretty hefty, but the important part is that it can be carried by just one person. Now let me just, oh, okay, oh, oh, okay. 2,100 Davy Crockett nuclear weapons were created and actively deployed in the years between 1961 and 1971 at a cost of half a billion dollars to the taxpayer. This was a real mini nuke. The Davy Crockett, nope. The Davy Crockett nuclear device approached the minimum practical size for a fission bomb. The bomb was small, but it still packed the energy equivalent of 10 to 20,000 pounds of TNT into something small enough that you could pick up and carry. This was a relatively speaking tiny yield for a nuclear weapon, and reportedly during testing, the Davy Crockett only produced minor blast damage. What really made this weapon scary was the fallout. Ho, oh, ho. Oh. All right, this should be far enough away. Oops, it's definitely not far enough. Okay, what made the Davy Crockett so potentially dangerous was the amount of radiation that a warhead would spew out upon detonation. If you were within 500 feet of a Davy Crockett blast, you would be doused with enough rads to kill you in a few days, if not a few hours. If you were a thousand feet away, you would initially feel some nausea and some confusion, and then you'd feel fine. Unfortunately, they called this the walking ghost condition because you're dead, you just don't know it yet. Your body hasn't caught up to the fact that critical components inside of you, like your bone marrow, have been fatally damaged. If you move back out to a quarter of a mile from a Davy Crockett blast, your chances of survival are improving, but they're still not great. Move a third of a mile away or more, and you'll probably survive, though your lifetime risk of cancer has gone up more than you would want it to. The Davy Crockett weapon system has the distinction of being the last open air nuclear test the United States ever conducted. They found them to be wildly inaccurate, and though they were actively deployed for over a decade, thankfully, one was never fired. This is all fine and dandy, science boy, but how does the Davy Crockett really compare to the Fat Man system? It's seriously close, and now I'm over encumbered. Just a. To see just how close we came to real mini nukes, let's compare the real and the fictional directly. This is the actual size of both warheads. As you can see, the Davy Crockett is a lot larger, and it's about six times heavier if you weigh the mini nuke based on what it weighs in Fallout survival mode. Though, the diameters are pretty similar, and like the Fat Man and the mini nuke, the Davy Crockett needed a separate launcher to fire, and once it was fired, it had no failsafe. It just detonated. So both of these weapons are similar in that they're more like grenades than they are missiles. What, I'm still over encumbered? I dropped like 20 cans already. Ugh. I'm not dropping those papers, I might need them. Unlike the Fat Man in Mini Nuke though, the Davy Crockett weapon system had decent range up to four kilometers. But then again, it had to have decent range because it could make a quarter mile of Earth uninhabitable for 48 hours. This range though means that a target wouldn't even see the warhead coming. Oh no! Oh. The biggest similarity between the two weapon systems, though, might be the boom. From all the nuclear testing that we've done, we've established a relationship between the height of the mushroom cloud and the yield of the weapon. Looking to recent Fallout games, the mushroom cloud of the mini nuke looks to be about three death claws tall, and if each death claw is nine to ten feet tall, that means the yield of the mini nuke is sub one kiloton, exactly the same energy range as the Davy Crockett. 
And thanks to historical footage, we don't even have to speculate about whether or not a Davy Crockett warhead and a mini nuke look the same in action. Put the two weapons side by side and it more or less matches. Someone at Bethesda must have done their homework because video games get better graphics and armies get new weapons, but under the same constraints in this universe, physics, physics never changes. So Fallout's famous mini nuke and Fat Man system were real. The Davy Crockett weapon system is as close as you can get to something in the Fallout universe. Of course, the Fat Man would have to have greatly increased range to not irradiate the user completely, but the fact that a real weapon so closely matches a fictional one to me is rad. In the Fallout universe, a universe centered around advanced nuclear technology, it's even plausible that the Fat Man is just a fictional extension of the Davy Crockett system. The Davy Crockett is designated M28, and the Fat Man is designated in Fallout as M42. Sometimes fiction is just as strange as the truth, because science. Actually, I know that Bethesda did do their homework because I spoke to them about this, and though they were definitely aware of the Davy Crockett weapon system, they think that they developed the Fat Man actually before they even knew about it. And going through Fallout lore, it says that the Fat Man testing uh, was initially really bad because it had uh, very decreased range, just like, just, just like the Davy Crockett, and you didn't want the range to blow yourself up and irradiate you, so science? Pop culture, one tumbling wheel. Thank you again to Fallout 76 for sponsoring this episode of Because Science. Bethesda Game Studios, the award-winning creators of Skyrim and Fallout 4, welcome you to Fallout 76, the online prequel where every surviving human is a real person. Work together, or not, to survive. Under the threat of nuclear annihilation, you will experience the largest, most dynamic world ever created in the legendary Fallout universe. Fallout 76 will be available worldwide on Wednesday, November 14th, but you can pre-order the game at participating retailers today. Play the beta first on Xbox One. Thank you so much for watching. If you want more of me, you can go to alpha at projectalpha.com and sign up now for a free trial. If you do that, you can get this show two days earlier before anyone else. If you want to follow Because Science and give me suggestions for future episodes, you can follow me at these handles here.